Hey, this is Joshua of the Decarceration Nation podcast, and today I want to talk to you about the old saying, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. For years, this saying has been an easy reply to any reporting about brutal conditions in our prisons and jails. As a people, for some reason, we love to cloak our cruelty in memes and glib sayings. Once and for all, let's finally slay this beast. First, the argument from public safety and from self-interest. If you care about public safety, you should care about conditions in prisons. Why? Here's how Rachel Barco put it. It's good to remember there's a lot of things we can do to help people and help us. You don't have to be nice or empathetic. You could be truly selfish and say, I'd like to be safer. I could be safer if instead my tax, instead of my tax dollars going to support facilities that do a terrible job when someone is incarcerated, support facilities that offer the right kind of programming. That way, when someone gets out, they're less likely to reoffend. And also, the largest meta-analysis ever done by David Rudman of the Open Philanthropy Project, the largest one ever done on the subject of prisons, concluded that, that prisons, even accounting for incapacitation, create more crime than they solve, which means that we're not getting a good public safety benefit by investing so heavily in prisons. Or you could just think of it this way. 96% of all people going to prisons will one day be coming home. How they come back matters, and it matters to all of us. Okay, now the argument from ethics. People are more than their worst moment. I can't tell you how many people I've met who were sentenced for killing someone who had no idea that they were capable of killing someone until they snapped when it happened. I also can't tell you how many people who, I, who I've met who've committed horrible crimes and later turned their lives around and started helping people and saving lives, even saving lives. I, I saw it in prison and I've seen it many times since I came back from prison. When we throw people away, we don't just punish them, we prevent them from the good deeds that they could do in the future. Also, as the great Dave Chappelle once said, we have to attack systems, not people. Attacking people doesn't fix any of the reasons why people become violent or why trauma and mental illness or addiction pour fuel on the fire of violent crime in this country. In addition, turning people over to a brutal system says more about us than it does about them. It says we're taking part in the chain of agency of many of the same kinds of behaviors that we are sending people to prison for in the first place. In many cases, we are all sitting around literally enjoying when people get hurt or traumatized. I often call this prison porn. Also, forgiveness is a huge part of my personal faith tradition, and I think of most faith traditions in the world. People change, and we should have hearts capable of forgiveness. In particular, right now, nobody who's in prison was sentenced to die from COVID-19, and prisons were not made to protect people from pandemics. Okay, now the argument from the perspective of democracy. The mere fact that incarceration has become our default response to a social problem, so much so that we actually usually sentence people with misdemeanor crimes to incarceration, we should start to question our actual commitment to freedom. Has freedom become more of a political slogan, more of a brand than an actual thing now? Hollow patriotism uttered only to identify yourself as a life member of a club? Or have we become so disconnected from its importance that we believe that even if everyone else goes to prison, it will never be us? Let me tell you a secret. Almost nobody who goes to prison believes that they were going to go to prison. Whatever the answer, incarceration be some, should be something we only do with great reluctance and with extreme care because we are supposed to be in the freedom business. It is entirely antithetical to who we are supposed to be as a country, and yet we lead the entire world by far in the forced deprivation of freedom. Some will say, no, we're a nation of laws. Freedom and law are natural antagonists. They are mutually eroding. Laws should be adopted with great care and weighed primarily for their impact on freedom. Are we citizens united, united by a declaration of laws, or are we citizens united by a declaration of independence? They will, these people will continue. They'll say, but we're defined by the rule of law, this magical phrase, phrase the rule of law. But it wasn't adherence to law that made, it dis made us different. It was the notion that not only were we under law, 
Our government was constrained by laws. Our government was constrained and could not simply take away people's rights and their freedom. People have inalienable rights. They should not be subject to the whims of government, and they should not have those rights suspended on whims, like about misdemeanors or about mild you know, cases of, of, of crime. There should be, at best, taking away someone's freedom should be reserved for the most important crimes, not every crime. So from the perspective of freedom, when we say, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime, all of us should literally break out in a rash. Time is not what we're supposed to be about. We should be about finding a better way. We should be about trying to find a better way to solve our social problems aside from putting people in cages. And we should remember that incarceration is both a policy failure and a, fa a failure of our collective imaginations. The more we become accustomed to ignoring incursions of freedom in the name of safety, the easier it will become for the forces of safety to come for your freedom when crises hit. Okay, now the argument from the perspective of justice. If you can't do the time, don't commit the crime, give social permission to prisons to destroy, abuse, and kill people. No matter what happens inside, we just ignore the ethical costs and pretend these are not human beings. Sometimes we even collectively get off on the idea of people in prisons being tortured, and we make all kinds of movies about it, and, 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 and everybody gets so happy to say things like, boy, I can't wait till they get, you know, get to prison and they're in the shower and that kind of stuff. That's not okay. There's nothing healthy about that kind of thinking. Justice is about amends. It's about being responsible for what you did, and it's about healing the wound you created. It's not about torture and punishment. Torture is a crime. It's not justice. This kind of thinking also assumes that our criminal code is rational, and that sentences and sentence lengths are rational based on evidence, and we know that's not true. I challenge anyone to provide empirical research suggesting that sentence lengths have anything to do with logic. They don't. We made them all up. The evidence I've seen suggests that any sentence over 10 years is counterproductive to public safety. It also assumes that prison is the best and appropriate answer to social problems like PTSD for veterans, addiction, mental illness, failure to pay child support, and a million other problems that should never be dealt with with incarceration. Does anyone believe that prison is the best answer to social problems? Really? Have you, do you know anyone who's had any of those problems? Do you think prison was the appropriate solution? I don't, and I've certainly had the experience. It also assumes that innocent people are never convicted, and we, we absolutely know this isn't true. We know this isn't true because there's an organization called The Innocent Project that uses DNA to prove that people were convicted when they were innocent. There's a new Netflix uh, documentary series on it right now. Uh, that as far as I know, the Innocence Program pro Project has, has freed at least 367 people, many of whom served decades of time after being, when they were innocent, they were never guilty of the crime in the first place. This is devastating to the argument that they should be punished and should be punished cruelly. This argument also assumes that brutality is the same thing as justice. People are seriously injured, sexually assaulted, and killed in prison. Just a few months ago, in Michigan, uh, I'm sorry, a Michigan court settled a case where hundreds of kids which, who were tried as adults and forced to serve in adult facilities were abused physically and sexually by other incarcerated people and even by prison staff. Was this justice? Is this what we should want from our prison system? Is this just desserts? Should, you know, it just seems absurd to me that we continue to make arguments like this. This also assumes that the system is not racially disparate, and it clearly is. We know from every bit of evidence that you can find our criminal justice system is racially disparate. We know that people of color are more likely to be arrested, charged, sentenced, and sentenced to longer sentences. We live every day knowing we are running a system that is fundamentally unjust, and yet we do nothing about it, and even cheerlead for the system. If you agree with nothing else I say here, this is something that we should deeply trouble every single person who hates discrimination and, 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 and every single person who believes that every person is created equal before the law. Don't do the crime if you can't handle the time is also a way of washing our hands of our own complicity in prison conditions and in, frankly, getting off on prison violence. Almost everyone who makes this argument seems like that's what they're really about. There is a lot, also a lot of ethical tension between committing a brutal crime is wrong 
And the way we should deal with brutal, brutal crimes is committing or allowing more brutal crimes to exist or be committed against the people who are perpetrators. That just doesn't make sense. In addition, not everybody who's in prison was convicted of a brutal crime. So the idea that they should get brutality simply because, for instance, they didn't pay child support seems absolutely absurd to me. This is usually where someone says something like, what about the victims? And I totally agree that victims' voices are important. I don't believe... But I don't believe that anyone should justify state-sponsored torture. And as Lenore Anderson of the Alliance for Safety and Justice put it, survivors of crime are increasingly advocating for new approaches to public safety that focuses on what works to stop crime cycles. Survivors want more focus on rehabilitation that reduces recidivism. The number one thing that people who are crime survivors generally say that they want is for people not to be able to commit crimes again. And if prison generates more recidivism, we are not doing what victims want. Trauma creates more trauma. And as Danielle Surratt of Common Justice put, put it in the context of today, you know, what we're dealing with today with COVID, People often talk about incarcerating people, incarcerating people as sending them away. One of the lessons we are facing in this COVID-19 pandemic is incarcerated, is, is incarcerated people and their loved ones have always been known. There is no such thing as a way. People do not disappear. They go to prisons. COVID-19 makes those routes clear, but it's not just the viruses that transverse them. The violence inherent in prisons always becomes a feature, not just of incarceration, but of our society. The harm we inflict on people is never contained behind the walls. And that, more than anything else, should convince you that this argument is not a particularly good one. Some will now say, but what about deterrence? Mountains of evidence conclude that certainty of punishment deters while the length or severity of sentence does not. In addition, according to John Pfaff uh, in his new article, we only punish about 5% of all violent crime, which means our system is failing almost entirely to deter violent crime. And finally, do the people who work in jails and prisons also deserve what they get simply because they took a job in, 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 in the incarceration business? Violence and brutality impacts them directly, too. The constant trauma impacts them intellectually, emotionally, physically, and right now over 100 of them in Michigan have become invicted, infected with COVID-19 simply because they had the temerity to go to work every day. Let's stop parroting bad narratives and start working together to find better answers to social problems. Incarceration is a failure of imagination. Incarceration is a public policy failure. We have to challenge ourselves to do better.